Hello. Welcome to the last session of the first day of PyCon Today 2019. Um, we're going to be starting off the session with lightning talks. Uh, so, uh, hands up if you've given a lightning talk before. Oh, uh, hands up if you've been to a lightning talk before. Uh, hands up if you know what a lightning talk is. Hopefully this includes everyone who put their hands up in the previous two sets. Um, so hands up if you don't know what a lightning talk is. Cool. So quite a few of you, and I notice you're all lurking in the back, so don't do that next time. <laughs> um, so lightning talks are short talks. They're five minutes uh, with a strict deadline. So the way the strict deadline works is once we get to 30 seconds to go, I'm going to hold up two fingers. Uh, we're going to clap with, with two fingers kind of softly. And then when the person reaches five minutes, um, we're going to um, generate thunderous applause. And they're going to take a bow and leave the stage if they haven't finished. Um, cool. Um, lightning talks, I, I it's possible that we might still have lightning talks uh, slots available for tomorrow. Um, but they're running out fast if there still are any. So um, if you have something to well, you'd like to tell people about, um, or you just want to speak for the first time with limited exposure to danger, um, as send an email to talks at za.pycon.org kind of, I don't know, during the session. Um, or you can risk tomorrow morning. Cool. Um, so without further ado, first up, we have uh, Pietras Teron speaking to us about the inverted UI. Murder. Volume good? Yeah. Guys, my name is Peter Strohn, and I want to tell you about one of the most frustrating things for me in almost all software, which I call the inverted UI, because I was inverted. In my experience, 99% of software is the wrong way around. If I run into my friend James Saunders, he's in the audience somewhere, I say, James, we need to grab a, there he is, we need to grab a beer. We do, by the way. James says, that sounds great, man. So I pull out my calendar. What does my calendar want to know? When and where? I don't know when James is free. I don't even know when I'm free, let alone where would be a convenient place. My intent was to have a beer with James, not to figure out the right place for it. So we should be able to capture our intent and let the machines figure out when is a convenient time and a convenient place. The next big offender is email. I open up an email and I, I'm confronted with the to field. So I'm like, okay, I think it's for the CEO. So I type in a subject, but I don't really know what the email is about yet. And then I start writing out the body, I go, oh, I better CC and Linda from logistics. And uh, I finish the body and finally I rewrite the subject <laughs> because it was wrong to start with. It's the wrong way around. This one is a little bit more controversial, but file systems are inverted. This is a screenshot from Finder I just took. It allows me to make a new folder, but not a new file. Do you know why? Because the file system needs a name for my file. But I don't know what I'm going to name the file yet, let alone what function I'm going to write inside of it. OK, it's called Finder. But the reason I opened it up was to make a file. So it's, I, I think these things are broken, mostly. Ugh, your username is already taken. I was just trying to give you some money, man. Just remember that and let me pick a username later. Or better yet, pick the username for me. Don't make me decide, like, sweet baby cakes 87. <laughs> so don't make your naming or indexing problem my problem, especially if you know more about the problem than I do, which is, you know, what's available and what's not. So the solution, which I call the incremental UI, is the opposite. And I'll give you some examples of things that work really well that are, in my view, incremental. Copy-paste. I can copy something and I can paste it later. I didn't paste and copy. I don't have to say, where are you going to paste this before I was allowed to copy it? Simple like, little distinction. Another thing that got it right, and I think this is why we all like using Python and, and modern dynamic languages, I don't need to name my variables uh, before I can write a value. 
and I can write an anonymous function because I'm building it incrementally up in my mind. I don't know, so foo, you know, it's called foo or bar. Just skip that nonsense. That's why the REPL is so successful, in my opinion. It's incremental. The most functional, the most popular functional programming language in the world is Excel. Aside from the lambda calculus, I think the reason is because it doesn't make you name your values, your symbols. It imposes a Cartesian namespace on your worksheet, which you can optionally refer to later. Because I don't know what one, two, three is going to be. I'm still exploring this tool. So Excel really got it right. And I, I would argue that it's a big reason why it's so successful. So if you like that, tomorrow I'm doing the closing keynote at 4 o'clock. I love talking about software UI. Come complain at me about your inverted UIs. And I uh, hope you have a beautiful conference. My name is Pietras. Have a great day. Thank you, Pietras. Uh, do you want to just hand the mic over to Richard? Oh, up next we have uh, Richard Vessel speaking to us about developing drone flight software for the Raspberry Pi, um, and he's doing it without slides. This might have been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so first of all, um, I took a very unconventional approach in developing drone software. First of all, if you're not using an Arduino, it's very questionable what you're doing because Arduino, you're going to be using compiled software. You're going to be using C or C++, or it has its own version of C, but I've only recently gotten into C, so I wanted to use Python. So I got myself a Raspberry Pi, which is also not a good approach because it has Linux on it, so you're adding more overhead to the whole system, but it makes it easier to develop. So this talk isn't going to be so much of Python. It's going to be about if you're looking into developing a drone, just some basics you should know about it. Um, but I will be touching on some of the Python aspects. So um, first of all, what is a drone? A drone is obviously just, if you look at a quadcopter, it has four rotors, and this allows it to fly. Now, many people have a very simplistic idea of what a drone is, but it actually involves calculus um, for its basic maneuverability. Um, the reason is because when you have a controller, when you say you want to move forward, you're not changing the back rotors constantly. You're changing them so that they can go to a certain angle and then all the rotors will have equal thrust so that it moves forward but it doesn't continually move forward. Now, the way you approach this problem to get it to a specific angle but not any further is using something known as a PID controller and this is where the calculus comes in. Due to the fact that I'm not going to go into too many details, I'm not going to go into PID controllers, that's all control theory. Um, but basically, you need an actual angle and a desired angle. So when you're looking at a Raspberry Pi, you can get something called an IMU, which has a gyroscope and an accelerometer. And from there, you can get your um, actual angle. And you can get this using something known as a complementary filter, or you can use a Kalman filter. Um, so that is the main issue when it comes to changing the maneuver, like maneuvering the drone. The first main problem that I came into was the controller. When you have your RC controller feeding into the Raspberry Pi, what data does it communicate? It doesn't communicate serial information necessarily. It uses an, something known as a PWM signal, which is a signal that changes between ones and zeros at a certain frequency. In my case, I used a 50 hertz signal, so it goes to one 50 times a second. And instead of being able to figure this out by hardware, I use software. So you basically, you need microsecond precision for this. You need to have Python go through a loop, which is one approach, and see how many times does it go through one? How many times does the signal change to one? And then how long does it stay at that signal? For example, 20, uh, 200 microseconds. Um, I use something known as um, edge detection, which is kind of like interrupts. So instead of using a loop and constantly you know, being computationally expensive, you can just use um, this so you can run in the background. And this is where Python comes into it. I use a threading library so that it can run in the background instead of you know, it taking up the main space of the program. And then obviously you need an output. You need the motors to change values. The way you do this is also by PWM signal. But a Raspberry Pi doesn't have a way to do this because it just has GPIO, so you need to have a hat. 
and somebody, uh, when it was the talk about, you know, the Top Gun flying and all that, um, you also mentioned Adafruit, which is the developer of, um, not MicroPython, as you can see, I didn't prepare this very well. Sorry? CircuitPython, Circuit Python, yes, thanks. Um, so yes, um, I use the Adafruit hat to output the PWM signals so that the motors can change the thrust. Um, as I said, Python is not very efficient to code in, but it is a very nice language, and I mean, everyone here, I'm pretty sure, enjoys the language quite a lot. And that is about all the Python and the drone stuff without going into like too many of the extra details. So I hope so if anybody here is interested in drone development, I can speak about this for like hours. So if anybody wants to talk about it, you can find me after the talk then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Setting my timer. Cool, you're ready to go? Yes, thank cool. you. Next up, we have Billy Einkammerer speaking about, uh, I'm not a developer, but I'm learning Python. Yes. Hi, guys. OK, before, before I delve into it, firstly, um, this is my first lightning talk or talk at a conference. So I'm going to take a photo of you. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> there we go. If I do more, it might become my thing. Um, secondly, quickly, who here is a Vitality member? Okay, don't know if you noticed, but there's a little box outside. You can register a, <laughs> a gym session. <laughs> How cool is that? Okay, um, anyways. <laughs> Coding is not just for developers. Um, I believe strongly in this. I run a development house. I run a software solutions company. I employ developers. I started as a developer many, many years ago until I realized that these guys coming out of uh, university knew about 100 times what I knew, could do it faster, could do it better, and uh, so I started employing them instead. Um, and then I started running the business and building the business. And so I stopped coding. I don't know, does anyone here know Cold Fusion as a programming language? used to be popular. I'm showing my age now. <laughs> I went from cold fusion to PHP to running the business. And then after a couple of years of running this business, I wanted to get back into code. And um, so what I did was I started a small learn to code group, um, which is now a meetup. And there's going to be a business card in your packs tomorrow about our meetup, which is um, to learn to code using Python. It's every Thursday. But I started this because I, I, I needed to scratch that itch to get back into code. My reasons were firstly to gain or to regain the respect and understanding of my employees so that um, I would be a boss that understood when they started throwing around definitions and talking about Kubernetes and you know, stuff like that. I'd know what they meant. My other reason was to be able to build prototypes. I, is that the time already? Oh, <laughs> my watch says different. The other reason was to build prototypes because I always think of ideas and I want to build these things and not have to pay people. And then if it works, then I'll pay people to build it. Then also to keep my mind sharp and then also to impress girls. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, but I firmly believe that coding isn't just for, it isn't just for developers. People here, a lot of you here, are developers. You're paid by your employers to code every day, day in and day out. There's some people here who are not developers. You might be auditors, you might be in the financial sector, you might be um, a scientist, a marine biologist, various industries where you can actually bring on the code to augment your role. So it's very popular, especially Python with data science. Um, there are ways now that in your own job you can integrate automation. So what that means is you can actually make your job enjoyable again because that dull and boring and mundane copy-paste rubbish that you have to do day in and day out 
can become a challenge in the form of a script that takes seconds to achieve and you've, you've pretty much won a whole lot of time to do other stuff. And you can add value to your position. So you enjoy what you're doing more and uh, you're more valuable to your company. And so we're finding this with our meetup. There's a lot of people that come that want to learn to code and not all of them want to become developers. And I think that's fine because I strongly believe that it's, it's like learning a language. You don't learn French to, uh, to become a translator. You learn French to meet girls. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, the one of the one of the problems is I've only got 30 seconds left. So I'll wrap it up. One of the problems is you you feel like a bit of an imposter. You feel like a fake because you don't really code the way your devs do. But um, there's there's a way to to keep going. There's a way to keep plugging in with your code and improving. You join a community. You join. You find like-minded people. You talk about code. And the most important thing is to get actual practice. So. Find a project, find something interesting that you want to build, and flip and build it. Um, it's more about, uh, it's uh, my time. <laughs> it, it's not just about learning the syntax. We found out that uh, with our meetup, a lot of the times when we were just watching videos and then we tried an exercise, uh, thank you, <laughs> it didn't work, but, but, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but if we actually practiced, then you actually learn code. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you, Billy. Ah, well, I can say some things while Adriana is setting up. Um, so. Um, tomorrow we're going to be uh, handing out swag um, and swag bags, um, and that includes the 2019 edition of the awesome mugs we had last year, um, featuring our new logo. So, um, so be here for for your swag tomorrow and your mugs. Are you ready to go? Oh, you can pick up that one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, I was worried that this talk would be too Cape Town specific, but apparently there are lots of us here, so I guess it's fine. Um, so, load shedding. We all love it. It's great. Um, in Cape Town, the city of Cape Town has this convenient load shedding schedule, uh, which is a table which determines who gets shed when. Um, there are 16 zones. There are 12 time slots a day. So, it takes four days to do each zone three times, and then it comes back to the beginning. But if they just repeated that every four days, people would get quite upset because some people would always get shared at the middle of dinner time, and that would not be fair. You don't want some people to be upset all of the time. You want all the people to be upset some of the time. <laughs> so um, in the interest of fairness, after four days, uh, the zones get offset by one, and then up to the next four days, and after the next four days, and after that, the entire a uh, 16-day pattern repeats one more time, so there's a total of 32 days, except that there is never a 32nd day. And then it gets cut off at the end of the month and goes back to their, their, their first day of the month. And that's stage one, and then in stage two, when things start getting progressively worse and worse, and more screwdrivers start getting thrown into the turbines, um, they start doubling up and then tripling and then quadrupling. Um, but the same zones always get um, shed together, so first the one that's offset by eight, and then another one that's offset by four, and then the last one that's offset by four. So in the end, you have these zones that are grouped that are four zones apart. Um, so this is all very nice, but it answers the question, on this day of the month, who is going to get shed at this time, which is not normally the question that I want to answer. What I want to know is, when am I going to get shed? I want this in my calendar. And unfortunately, um, the very fair nature of this timetable makes it extremely difficult to add to Google Calendar because the repeating pattern is not something that iCal can understand because, because just no, they don't have a thing for this. So if you want to put this in your calendar, you basically have to take each day 
of the month and put it in separately and then make it repeat on the same day of the month. And then you have to repeat that for all the different stages. And then you have to do it in different calendars so you can like, you know, turn them on and off depending on what stage it is. So I did this by hand for like, a, you know, a couple of times when it, we were told that the shedding would be brief. And then when it turned out that that was in fact untrue, I decided that um, I would stop doing this by hand like an idiot and just write a Python script to do it for me. And so I did a thing, um, and are you all clapping? Are you just you know, rustling chip packets? Okay, um, so there is on GitHub under Confluence, which is my username, which I had before Atlassian, and they can't have it back. <laughs> it's mine, I saw it first. Um, there is a repository called Load Shedding, um, in which you will find the script, uh, which is a Python 3 script. It's all very basic. It's a bunch of maths, it's a bunch of string formatting. I'm not using any kind of iCal library because they were all like highly over-engineered and I didn't want this to have any dependencies. So this just, it just makes a string and then th puts things in the string. It wasn't very difficult. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of maths to do the actual uh, reproduction of the pattern. And then it generates um, the calendar for the particular zone that you've given it. And it can optionally either generate all of the, the um, shedding periods for that stage, or it can only generate all the shedding periods that are added in that stage, which allows you to have different kinds of calendars that you can toggle on and off depending on what your particular workflow is. Um, but you don't actually have to run this script yourself because I have already pre-generated all possible calendars. Uh, they're also, they're text, they're very little. So, um, all of the ones that are combined and all of the ones that are um, just for a particular stage, they're already there, so you can go there and you can, you can uh, either download the file and add it to Google Calendar or you can use the URL. Um, yeah, so if the next time, and I'm sure there's going to be a next time, the next time this happens, you don't have to add the stuff by hand, you can go over here and just add the calendar. And yeah, that's it, thank you. Oh, thank you, Adriana. Um, so we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, partially because none of the lightning talks took long for speakers to get set up, which is very unusual. Um, Alex, I'm not sure if you want to come start setting up now. Where is Alex? He was here, it's like a moment ago. <laughs> Alex? <laughs> um, uh, can someone find Alex for me? <laughs> um, and in the meantime, I'll continue saying some things, uh, which I'd actually planned to say during um, the lightning talks, but the, uh, everything ran too smoothly. So uh, kind of related to, to the mugs, um, who can like, name some sorting algorithms? <laughs> Bogo sort, yes. Do you want to quickly tell people how Bogosort works? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so excited for a moment. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so to someone just hopping on Bogosort, it actually is one of my favorite interview questions. I ask people to code Bogosort, um, usually because they, they haven't heard of it and it's not usually taught in computer science. Um, so does anyone else here know what Bogosort is? Um, sorry? Oh, was that a, that a yes, you know what it is? Nope? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you want to tell everyone what it is? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know. I think it's like, if I do burgers, so I'll probably try all the burgers, and then I'll sort it according to taste. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, not, not burger sort. <laughs> 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 Although that, that, that is actually more practically important in most people's lives <laughs> than Boko sort. Um, okay, let's try someone else. Is Boko sort the one where you continually randomly rearrange your array until it's sorted? Uh, correct. Awesome, okay. So, um, can anyone tell me uh, what the runtime of Boko sort is? So, <laughs> so the way Bogosort works, just to kind of reiterate, you take your list, you 
randomly shuffle it, and then um, and then you check to see if it's sorted. Um, yes. Yeah, so actually, that's an interesting question. What is the worst time? Infinite. Yes, exactly. Can you tell us why? <laughs> because if you randomly sort it, you might never get the right result. Yes. Yeah, so your random number has like generator has some like finite sequence length, and it's not hard to generate a list where the total number of possible orderings is longer than the possible set of random numbers that you can generate, uh, which means that the random number which would magically, like sequence of random numbers that would sort your list into the sorted order might not be one that you can generate. Um, cool, so uh, what is the sort that Python uses? Tim sort, yes. Uh, what is the fastest sort? Tim sort. Tim sort is in fact the fastest sort. Um, uh, not actually particularly large end. So, uh, so quick sort actually is the runtime of quick sort is surprisingly complicated. So the the average time um, is kind of um, usually n log n, but it requires it relies a lot on selecting the right pivots. Um, in practice, merge sort is a lot easier to get right. Um, so can someone tell me what's, so Tim sort is a kind of merge sort. Someone want to tell us what's awesome about Tim sort. Okay. Tim sort exploits um, the, the attributes of, of mostly sorted or already sorted lists. Well, that's the main part. Yes, yeah, ex exactly. Um, and um, it also exploits uh, reversed sorted lists. So um, if it finds a list which has a sort of reversed subsequence, it also just kind of copies that subsequence in. Uh, yeah, someone has something to say on the topic. How and under what special conditions can you get a sort algorithm to run in 2N? I don't know, is that a question someone else wants to answer? <laughs> I, I feel like it's a question that you want to answer. <laughs> Most sort algorithms run, run in times like n log n and so forth. However, if you have a limited size data set, for instance, an 8-bit int, you can have an infinitely long data set. You um, run that data into a histogram, which is 1n, and then you unpack, unpack the histogram, which is 1n. So in that case, you can do a sort in 2n. Yes, awesome. So probably actually worth while pointing out that although kind of n log n is the sort of fastest general case, there are often ways to sort faster. Uh, for example, things like radix sort, if you know something about what you're sorting. So now the question is, what does all of this have to do with the mugs? <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> You can indeed drink coffee from your mugs. You can also drink tea. Um, so the mugs contain the Zen of Python. And the Zen of Python was written by, uh, by Tim Peters, who is the same Tim that Tim Sort is named after. <laughs> um, so the mugs this year also have a bit of an Easter egg. Um, so. Um, in, in what you s oh, does everyone know what import this is? Yes? No? Okay, hands up, hands up if you don't know. Yeah, import this. Hands up, hands up if you do know. I'm just checking that. Hmm, that, that, those sets are not adding up to the complete set of people. <laughs> <laughs> hands up if you don't like putting up your hand. <laughs> um, so if you don't know, um, if you don't know um, kind of what import this does um, or what the Zen of Python is, um, A, you should look at the mugs tomorrow, um, but B, you should also go back to your kind of Python interpreter and type import space this and read a bunch of cool things that uh, Tim Peters, who wrote the best sorting algorithm in the world, um, wrote about Python and software development. Um, fun fact about uh, import this. So import this is actually recorded as a Python pep. Uh, do people know what peps are? Uh, so PEP is a Python enhancement proposal, and it's what you write if you want to suggest a change to Python, um, usually some, hopefully some sort of improvement. Um, but uh, the PEP is PEP20. Um, 
and the start up of the start of the pep says there are 20 it's a list of sort of 20 sayings or sort of cones about python development um, but if you write import this and you check carefully you'll see there are only 19 listed in the pep or in import this um, and that has something to do with the easter egg tomorrow <laughs> <laughs>